Hello everyone. What a crazy world we live in. I'll bet that everyone in this room knows what ED is, erectile dysfunction. You do because it has proven profitable to pour millions into making you aware of it. But there is another ED out there into which millions have also been poured to keep a secret, and that is endocrine disruption. Corporations discourage the use of the words and testing for endocrine disruption because they produce and sell products that contain chemicals that interfere with the endocrine system and do not want you to know that these chemicals are in the products found in your homes, offices, schools, and automobiles and have penetrated every environment, including the womb, on this planet. Although some manufacturers want you to believe that the chemicals and products they produce are safe, there is a growing body of health literature that suggests otherwise. In what follows, I will be sharing with you some of that evidence. Reports like this date back to the 1970s when the press featured stories about Bully, the young bisexual beluga whale found dead on the shore of the St. Lawrence River, and bisexual fish and birds around the Great Lakes and gay gulls along the California coast. But when a U.S. Geological Service team reported bisexual bass in the Potomac River, the Washington Post gave it the front page. And on Capitol Hill, it provoked a hearing by the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. The term endocrine disruption was used in the Federal Register write-up of that hearing 131 times. Since then, this article appeared in the Toronto Globe and Mail, describing the results of deliberately dosing a Canadian lake with the active ingredient in birth control pills, and the disappearance of the fathead minnows in the lake in two years. These reports raised genuine concerns about the efficiency of municipal sewage and drinking water treatment plants, as other pharmaceuticals, cleaning compounds, cosmetics, and shampoos are flushed down our sinks and toilets. Endocrine disruptors have been called stealth chemicals because they fly below the government's toxicological tests to protect human health and below the radar of most doctors in their clinical practice. At extremely low concentrations, they cause no visible health impairment at the time of exposure, but instead cause effects that are not expressed until years later. But if exposure takes place before birth, they can cause irreversible lifetime disorders. And now we know that the grandchildren of women who took DES, diethylstilbestrol, a female hormone used to prevent miscarriages back in the 1950s, and the grandchildren of women who were exposed to DDT, a pesticide with complex female hormone-like characteristics, in the 40s and 50s are now suffering gonadal and reproductive health problems today because of their grandmother's exposure although their mothers and they were never exposed to DES or DDT. As the technology of chemistry has become more and more sophisticated and precise, endocrine disrupting chemicals are now found in all environments, even in the womb, and in all human reproductive fiber and fluids. There is no placental or brain barrier to these chemicals. It is important to keep in mind that without properly functioning endocrine systems, species can go out of existence, just like the fathead minnows in the Test Lake in Canada. Now ignore the sex glands. You all know what they are. Instead, first look at the brain. Think of it as the control center and at the pituitary and hypothalamus critical endocrine glands that monitor hormone and enzyme levels throughout the body through a thermostat-like feedback mechanism. They turn on and off hormone production in organs, 
and turn on and off receptors in the target tissues where hormones do their job. These brain parts control hormones that operate the endocrine system in the range of a part per billion and parts per trillion. A part per trillion is equivalent to one second in 3,169 centuries. Up in the head, you also see the hippocampus. This tissue makes it possible for humans to process information and to be able to arrive at conclusions about the consequences of what they are seeing, hearing, or doing. It is here where we learn to love, get our parenting, altruism, and empathetic instincts. This is the part of the brain that makes us human and the ability to be sociable. The thyroid is deeply involved in reproduction and fertility and plays a major role in brain development, intelligence, and behavior as well. The adrenal glands, through the hormone aldosterone, control blood pressure and through the corticosteroids, work with the immune system. And then there is the pancreas. It produces insulin, a hormone that is in deep trouble, affecting millions described by the editor of a medical journal as the worldwide tsunami of diabetes. We now face a pandemic of disorders in the Northern Hemisphere. There is sufficient evidence from human and laboratory animal studies to suggest that these disorders could, in part, be the result of prenatal exposure to endocrine-disrupting chemicals. Before the 1950s, they were, these were rare disorders. But since the 1970s, all of these disorders began to increase. Think about this. Diabetes increased by 90% between 1998 and 2008. And it is predicted that one in three Americans and one in two minorities born from now on will develop diabetes in their lifetime. One in 150 children born has an autism spectrum disorder, and among boys, the odds are 1 in 59. For both diabetes and autism, the rate of incidence keeps increasing each year with no sign of tapering off. Approximately 1 in 125 boys are born with hypospadias, a condition where the urethra does not open at the end of the penis. As early as 1992, Danish medical doctors shocked the world when they reported a 50% drop in sperm count in the Northern Hemisphere over the previous 50 years. And several years later, they reported a syndrome of male health and reproductive problems that can be traced back to damage in the womb. A 2007 study showed a decline in testosterone levels of 1.2% per year with an overall decline of 17% in U.S. men over the past 20 years. A New Zealand study reported that sperm count dropped 50% over the past 20 years. These are all disorders that could have been initiated before birth. So why has toxicology failed to detect endocrine effects? Keep in mind that most of the pioneer researchers who discovered endocrine disruption were not toxicologists. They were wildlife and laboratory biologists, developmental biologists, medical researchers, long-term cancer researchers, and chemists who had little or no training in toxicology. And the US EPA refused to invite these people to the table when it was told in 1996 to come up with a set of screens and assays to detect endocrine disruptors in food and water. Instead, it let its advisory committees be controlled by corporate toxicologists and ignored those who had no conflict of interest. This growing community of scientists doing cross-disciplinary research in endocrine disruption was not locked into the traditional dogma that the dose makes the poison, as seen in adult laboratory animals when high-dosed and in humans when unintentionally exposed. 
by sliding the dose range much lower and testing at ambient concentrations. They kept getting results like these where an agonist turns on a system as the dose increases and then at a certain point the body starts to turn off the response although the dose continues to increase. This reflects the role of those parts of the brain kicking in that act like thermostats. These cross-disciplinary researchers are not using the super high doses used for toxicological testing in adult animals. Realistically, they used the mother as the delivery system to dose unborn animals with chemicals at 100 to 1,000 times lower doses than at which chemicals had previously been tested, which led to the new paradigm that timing of exposure is as critical as dose. Dose alone does not make the poison. And the most vulnerable time for a human being to endocrine disrupting chemicals is in the womb. And speaking of timing, let's go back to the early 1940s at the end of World War II when DDT and a long list of other chlorinated pesticides were put on the market by huge chemical companies converting to peacetime products. Each year, more and more cheap chemicals derived from the byproducts of processing crude oil and natural gas entered the market. Soon, these fossil fuel derived plastics became the choice for construction material, phasing out the use of steel in building materials, turning up in planes, automobiles, high impact sporting equipment, and in home building materials, packaging, and practically every consumer product on the market. They are used as fire retardants, lubricants, detergents, and in cosmetics, toiletries, toys, and clothing. We live in a plastic world. If you were born after 1950, you were exposed in the womb to many of those chemicals. And by the time you had your children in the 70s and the 80s, they would have been exposed to even more kinds of chemicals. And more often, as the products gradually became a part of our personal lives in our homes, workplaces, schools, transportation systems. We are looking today at children whose great great grandparents were among the first exposed in the womb and perhaps experiencing health problems that reflect their ancestors' exposure. I'm going to shift now to some of the research that prompts the concern that perhaps males in particular are at risk. Let's turn to one of these studies where 189 children had their cord blood tested at birth for PCBs and then at four and a half years of age were given a test to measure their lack of self-control, an ADHD-like symptom. If a child responded too soon or too late or too often to a signal on a computer screen, in this case it was a cat popping up in a window, it was counted as an error of commission. Then, at approximately seven years of age, 30 of the children in the study with the highest concentrations of PCB at birth and 30 of the children with the lowest PCB concentrations had an MRI done. The brain scan revealed differences among the children in the volume in square millimeters of the splenium, a rounded patch of tissue at the end of the corpus callosum in the brain. The areas of the brain that the splenium feeds into play a role in visual recognition and discrimination. And the splenium also integrates that with the proper motor response regions of the brain. Here you see the relationship between the children's cord blood, PCB concentrations, and errors of commission as a function of splenium volume. The children with the largest splenium are on the left side of the graph. They had the least errors. Those on the right with the smallest splenium had the highest percentage of errors, and they also held the highest concentrations of PCB in their blood at birth. And when the results were broken out by sex, it became apparent 
that the boys made twice as many errors of commission as the girl. The team working with these children has published a paper in which they report at age nine they found a three-point drop in IQ for every one part per billion of PCB increase in the children's blood at birth. And in this study, 15% of the boys and 5% of the girls were on medications for ADHD in the fourth and fifth grade. Interestingly, autism, another neurodevelopmental problem, affects boys three to nine times more often than girls, depending on the study. So let's switch into a high gear now and look deeper into this problem called the male predicament. It appears that boys are more at risk than girls, even before they are born. In Japan, between 1970 and 2005, the ratio of the male to female fetal deaths, that's deaths before birth, reached almost three. In other words, the boys were dying almost three times as often as the girls before they were born. Data such as this are not collected in the U.S. under our present health system. Canadian epidemiologists were able to go back in their records as far as 1930 and found that a decline in male-to-female births started to show up in 1970 which fits the timeline when one would begin to expect to see an effect at the human population level. They found a loss of 5.6 males per thousand between 1970 and 1990 in the eastern Atlantic region around the Great Lakes and Ontario. This significant decline in male births in eastern Canada is reinforced by the results of this recent study that may provide explanation for the obvious sex ratio shift in Eastern Canada. The normal birth ratio is 106 boys to 100 girls. In this Sarnia First Nation population, it is 56 boys to 100 girls. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reports that defects of sex organs were 8.5 times more prevalent among males than females. Urinary tract defects were 62% and gastrointestinal tract defects 55% more prevalent in males. The authors listed environmental exposure as possibly contributing to the urinary tract problems. The CDC also found that one in 125 boys were born with hypospadias, a defect where the urethra does not open at the end of the penis. And a Danish study found hypospadias in 1 in 118 males at birth, and the more severe cases were increasing, similar to the findings in the United States study. It is important to keep in mind that hypospadias is an underreported event in the U.S. Doctors are reluctant to put it on the birth record because it might stigmatize the boy and his family, and because insurance companies are reluctant to provide health insurance for boys with hypospadias, because their odds are high that they will develop fertility problems and early testicular cancer as they mature. There has to be a flaw in the health care system in this country if insurance companies have data like this, but the government does not. The medical journal Lancet reported that in the Netherlands, the grandsons of women who took DES, the female hormone I mentioned earlier to prevent miscarriages, have a significantly increased risk of developing hypospadias compared with boys whose grandmothers did not take DES. Now here you see a picture of hypospadias. As the opening gets closer and closer to the body, the condition becomes more and more severe often requiring a series of surgeries as the boys mature. This disorder is the result of disturbances around the 56th day of pregnancy at the end of the second month, often before a woman is not quite sure she is pregnant. At this time, under normal conditions, the male embryo's adrenal gland produces a small amount of testosterone that starts a cascade of chemical changes and events that initiate the growth of the penis and the urethra 
together. A little visual relief for you. I don't think endocrine disruptors had anything to do with this geological formation I found down in a canyon near my home. I am going to digress here for a minute from humans to alligators, where a wildlife biologist discovered that the alligators in Lake Apopka, Florida, had what appeared to be unusually small external gonads. He suspected that DDT, or its breakdown product DDE, might have caused the problem. Soon, EPA scientists began dosing rats with the range that DDE is found in the environment and discovered that it was a powerful anti-androgen. It caused hypospadias and other male developmental problems, such as undescended testicles, reduced sperm count and sperm quality in their rats. And this led to the discovery that there are many other anti-androgens in use today that include plastics, pesticides, and again, all produced from the products of cracking crude oil, processing natural gas, and burning coal. Here you see the effects of DDE, the breakdown product of DDT, in the rat pup on the right, whose mother was dosed with DDE. Note that shortened anogenital distance. DDE is still found in almost all living tissue around the world. It has a long half-life of 58 years in temperate climates. Evidence like this is being completely ignored when millions of euros and U.S. dollars are being poured into the promotion of reintroducing DDT around the world. The developmental anti-androgen effects and other multi-generational effects of DDT are never mentioned in these campaigns. Before we leave the alligators, it is interesting to know that if it had not been for Florida's Lake Woodruff National Wildlife Refuge, a relatively pristine oasis far from agricultural or industrial activity, we would not be aware of the high prevalence of hypospadias among humans. You see, prior to this, no one knew what an alligator's normal external genitalia and hormone chemistry looked like. The alligators from Lake Woodruff provided the gold standard for normal alligator gonadal development and reprotective success. With those relatively unexposed Lake Woodruff animals serving as controls, they were producing at the rate of about 90% or better compared with the Apopka gators at 10%. Now scientists might never have determined that there are chemicals in the environment that act as an anti-androgen. And I am certain that the CDCs could never have been convinced to look for the prevalence of hypospadias in the human population or to start monitoring for plastics in the urine of thousands of people across the country if it had not been for the alligators. Here you see the result of the CDC monitoring program for monobutylphthalate, MBP, a breakdown product of a class of chemicals used to make plastics flexible and kids' toys cuddly. From the CDC's nationwide survey of phthalates in human urine, they came up with this graph for MBP. Note that the majority of the people had about 30 parts per billion in their urine. Remember 30 parts per billion, I'm going to come back to that later. And also keep in mind that all those subjects on the right were women of childbearing age between 17 and 41. They held significantly higher concentrations than the men who were over in the cohorts on the left side of the graph. In laboratory animals, phthalates, like other anti-androgens, disrupt development at that critical stage where testosterone kicks in and the male's gonads begin to develop. And their brains are programmed for how they function throughout life. In this study, the urine of pregnant women was sampled throughout their pregnancies from various maternity clinics across the U.S. Shortly after birth, their son's anogenital distance and penile volume were measured, which turned out to predict the tendency towards partially descended or completely undescended testicles, reflecting similar results seen in lab animal studies. 
The researchers came up with what they called the AGD, the Anogenital Distance Index. Look here at the concentration of MBP found in the women whose boys had the lowest AGD index, or the shortest penises, 38 parts per billion. That is well within the norm of the largest segment of the human population. Now, as the list of synthetic antiandrogen grows, so does the list grow of products they are found in, from PVC, piping, window moldings, construction material, hospital and medical equipment, rubber ducts, most children's toys, cosmetics, perfumes, shampoos, hair conditioners, and rinses, flexible consumer products, furnitures, bedding, and so forth, and in large quantities as inert ingredients and pesticides. And like so many other chemicals, they are found in 98% of all human tissue tested. Let's take a closer look at what the Danes call the male dysgenesis syndrome. Increased incidence of undescended testicles and hypospadias, reduced sperm numbers and quality, increased incidence in testicular cancer in young men, increased need for assisted reproduction. They say that the syndrome has become more common that it is a result of disturbed development in the womb and was overlooked because of specialization in medicine. From birth on, the boys with undescended testicles and hypospadias go from one specialist to another as they mature. The surgeons and family practitioners all see the patient independently and consequently never get to see the whole picture. The Danes also suggested that future medical studies not focus on just one symptom alone, but be more comprehensive. It is interesting to note that boys with autism have greater odds of developing hypospadias and intestinal disorders. So why not? These tissues are all developing at the same time in the womb. My team and I argue that it should be no surprise that a chemical present in the womb environment can cause damage to multiple systems that are developing at the same time. But so far, public health authorities have not taken this into consideration, probably because of the constant call for cures and treatment, forcing research to focus on one disorder at a time and missing the big picture. So taking the Danes lead, I want to show you something my team and I have put together. We wondered if there might be a way to take the vast amount of health data in our database and package it into one relatively easy model that most people could understand and be internet accessible. Here you see our attempt to produce a simple picture of normal human development, showing some of the critical systems and organs necessary to construct a baby from fertilization to birth broken into 38 weeks. The columns are weeks. The vital organ systems are listed down the left side of the screen. And with your mouse, you will be able to wander anywhere on the screen and click on a black tick and read what takes place at that stage of development. In this case, the text reads testosterone production and also get the citation for that particular spot. Next, you will be able to go to the toolbar on top where it says select a chemical and click. In this case, I set it for bisphenol A, one of the highest profile and most contentious chemicals on the market today. Here you can see every body system where there is evidence that BPA exposure can interfere with or alter the development of the baby's systems or organs. Think of BPA as a single building block used to make polycarbonates and other resins. It is a very small and very simple chemical compound that, as you can see, can penetrate most vital body tissues. It does not build up and accumulate in human tissue like other poster child chemicals, such as the PCBs and dioxins and some pesticides. Yet it is found in virtually everyone's tissue at about one to two parts per billion because it is so versatile and has become incorporated into practically every product society depends upon today. We are continually exposed to it around the clock. 
Well, I have just spent the last 35 minutes talking about the male predicament. So let's go down and zoom in on the male reproductive system. And here again, you can click on a green tick and a pop-up will describe the results. The study design and provide the citation. And for the sciences watching this DVD, you will be able to click on the word PubMed. And if the article is in the government's database, it will pop up as well. For those of you who have been or are still confused by a series of government and industry reports stating that BPA is safe, keep in mind that the studies you just saw in the critical windows of development and many more like them are not taken into consideration by those declaring BPA safe. Those arguing BPA is safe lean on several flawed studies funded by industry and designed by toxicologists. The studies used crude endpoints that lack the sensitivity to link function with low-dose exposure. Keep in mind that a lot is at stake for the chemical manufacturers producing the endocrine disrupting chemicals, and especially for those corporations who use the chemicals in their products that come in contact with you every day. And going to the very source of the problem, there are the energy corporations who profit from the sale of the highly toxic byproducts from processing oil and natural gas as the elemental feedstocks to the chemical manufacturers who make endocrine disrupting chemicals out of them. So, can we resolve the male predicament and alter the spiraling downward course of public health that is threatening future generations? I think we can if we move fast and take a new approach. Somehow we have to bridge the disconnection between what families and clinicians in their practice are dealing with every day and the design of the testing programs the government is using to address the problem. EPA has had 13 years to come up with a set of screens and assays to detect endocrine disruptors and there is not one test available yet. Those who for the past two decades who gave birth to and became part of the new discipline endocrine disruption must be recruited to solve the problem. Up to now, the government has let endocrine disruption be dominated by those with corporate big pockets who got it wrong. And most important, the problem cannot be solved by looking for cures and treatments. Instead, the goal of this new approach must be prevention and precaution. We have rapidly become a caretaker society where an increasing percentage of our population is dependent upon medications or care from the time they are born until they die. The trend does not appear to be lessening. Today in the U.S., we are spending more money on treating diabetes than on education. We are producing fewer and fewer tax-paying citizens. We are producing more and more children with learning disabilities and serious social problems. We are now moving into the fourth generation of individuals exposed to endocrine disrupting chemicals in the womb. The statistics tell us that something is wrong with the human condition that males are targeted, that time is getting short. What we need immediately is a crash program in inner space research. It must be the most important research program in the 21st century and funded accordingly. Let's face it, the womb environment must be cleaned up if we are going to have enough fully functioning individuals with the cognition steadfastness, leadership ability, and courage to place human health above the bottom line and take back government from corporations in order to solve this problem. We need leaders who will take ED out of the closet and who can see the link between the global pandemic of irreversible disorders and the dire need to find alternatives to fossil fuels. So if there is only one message you take away from this lecture, 
I want it to be that a vast number of widely dispersed fossil fuel derived chemicals are altering how our children are constructed before they are born and how they behave and function in adulthood and could be posing a more imminent threat than climate change to the survival of humans and all living organisms on Earth. Now where I live, I see a lot of reminders like this of the good old days before endocrine disruptors and the need for Viagra and Cialis. I call them symbols of hope.